Welcome to everyone here in Washington and from around the world tuning in online. My name is Tino Cuellar and I'm the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Over a century ago, Andrew Carnegie created this institution with the aim of using knowledge, ideas, and relationships to help eliminate the scourge of war and to improve human prosperity through international cooperation. That's the mission we've remained focused on to this day. Now we're gathering late in the year, uh, in a year that shows how far the world is from that very goal. In recent months alone, we've seen horrifying violence and armed conflict around the world, from Azerbaijan's lightning offensive in Nagorno-Karabakh to Russia's continued war in Ukraine, conflict in Sudan, a coup in Niger, continued fighting in Ethiopia. This pattern of violence continued three weeks ago, tragically, as Hamas fighters carried out a brutal terrorist attack in Israel that took the lives of more than 1,400 people, overwhelmingly civilians, and kidnapped more than 200 people, according to official reports. In the days since that attack, the Israeli military has conducted thousands of airstrikes against Hamas targets in Gaza, cut off electricity and water supplies, and is reportedly preparing for a ground invasion. These events are already taking an enormous toll on civilians. Authorities in Gaza report that the fighting since October 7th has killed more than 5,000 people. The UN estimates that there are 1.4 million people internally displaced in Gaza. And although the UN estimates civilians in Gaza need approximately 20 times as much aid as they are currently receiving, negotiations over so-called humanitarian pauses to allow aid are ongoing. The crisis threatens to escalate with immediate implications for countries across the region from Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon to Iran and Saudi Arabia. So all together, we're at a painful chapter for the world and one that looks like it may get worse before it gets better. That said, the world has shown time and again that a combination of nuanced analysis, principled leadership can help mitigate the worst of human violence and put the world on a path towards peace. And at some level, we have no choice but to make the most of these peaceful tools in a world that needs both moral clarity and nuance. That's the vision for global cooperation the Carnegie Endowment exists to support. We hope today's conversation, which will cover both the conflict's immediate dynamics and longer term potential for resolution and prospects for peace, will be a contribution to that goal. I'm grateful to welcome four analysts and former policymakers on these issues to Carnegie for the discussion. Celine Tubol is the co-executive director of the Economic Cooperation Foundation an Israeli think tank, where she leads the organization's work on the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Mustafa Bagudi is a Palestinian physician, activist, and politician who serves as General Secretary of the Palestinian National Initiative, also known as Al-Mubdara. He previously served as Minister of Information of the Palestinian Unity Government and has been a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council since 2006. Marwan Washer is the Vice President for Studies here at Carnegie where he oversees our work on the Middle East, both in DC and in Beirut. He served as a foreign minister for Jordan from 2002 to 2004, and as deputy prime minister from 2004 to 2005. He was also Jordan's ambassador to Israel. Amr Hamzawi is the director of Carnegie's Middle East program. He's a political scientist and scholar who has written extensively on governance and democratization in the Middle East and North Africa. He is also a former member of the People's Assembly and was elected in Egypt's first parliamentary elections after the January 25, 2011 revolution. He is a former member of the Egyptian National Council for Human Rights as well. Moderating today's conversation is Joyce Karam, senior news editor at Al Monitor and an adjunct professor at George Washington University. Welcome all of you in these trying times. And Joyce, you have the floor. Thank you. Um Thank you, Tino. Thank you, Carnegie, uh, for hosting this timely uh, panel. I'm Joyce Karam, Senior News Editor at Al Monitor, and will be your moderator for the event. Uh, we meet at a very dark moment in the Middle East. More than 7,000 Palestinians, 1,400 Israelis have been killed in the last 20 days. We are seeing clashes on the Lebanon border in a manner we haven't seen since the 1990s. Israel struck Syria four times in that same period. Meanwhile, a humanitarian catastrophe is already unfolding in Gaza. Fuel, clean water shortages, hospitals and shelters are over capacity. How did we get here? What is next? And does anyone have an exit strategy? 
with me to the, to the as uh, Tino mentioned, an excellent uh, uh, group of thinkers and uh, regional uh, voices who have experienced firsthand the brunt of uh, this conflict. Marwan uh, Moasher, you all know him, uh, Vice President uh, of Studies at Carnegie and former Jord Jordanian uh, Foreign Minister, a veteran diplomat uh, on Middle East issues. Uh, Dr. Baruhuti, a physician, a Jerusalemite, uh, who serves as General Secretary for Al Mubadara, the Palestinian National Initiative. It's a third way movement that's not Hamas or the Palestinian uh, Authority. Amr Hamzawi, uh, a friend, a senior fellow at Carnegie, where he has written extensively on vulnerable societies and authoritarianism in the region. Uh, Celine Tuboul, an executive director of the Economic Cooperation Foundation and working on policy recommendations for the day after in uh, Gaza. So without further uh, ado, Dr. Barghouti, I want to start with you. How did we get here? And you're in Ramallah like right now. How is the situation on the ground? Thank you. I, I just need to ask you how how many minutes you want me to speak for? Uh, since we only have an hour and it's five of us, so would appreciate if you can keep it short. Yeah, well, just tell me, 10 minutes. Two minutes, when... two minutes would be good. Two minutes? Yes, and then we can follow up. <laughs> ah. Well, two minutes is too short. Anyhow. I, three uh, minutes. Even, we'll... even BBC gives me more. It's okay. Uh, I, I would like to say, okay, you raised many questions, but very shortly. Uh, I think what we witnessed today, this disaster, is a result of two processes, of two, two things that didn't take place. The first one is, and for that I hold the American administration responsible, that during the last three years, the Palestinians have been demanding and requesting and begging for an initiation of a peace process, which Netanyahu has blocked since 2014 completely. And this American administration, including the president and his state secretary, kept saying there is no, the time is not appropriate because, of course, Israelis didn't want that. So lost all these three years, we lost any opportunity. Second, the biggest problem was, or the biggest mistake was not to allow Palestinians to have their democratic free elections in 2021. Uh, all the polls have shown that had we have these elections, we would be in a completely different situation today because neither Hamas nor Fatah would have the chance to, would have had the chance to get a majority, an absolute majority. We would have ended with a pluralistic system. Uh, probably this would have ended the situation of one party rule, both in Gaza and West Bank. But that was not allowed. Israel was adamantly against Palestinian elections. The PA canceled the elections on wrong grounds, and the United States was also against having free democratic elections, spreading the fear that Hamas would win, which, which is not true. Anyhow, the outcome is what we see today. But uh, uh, of course, none of us would be, would be supportive of or accepting any attack on any civilian, including Israeli or Palestinians. Uh, but I have to say that what we see today in the world media and everywhere is an act of dehumanization of Palestinian people, uh, allowing, the, 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 allowing Israel to commit three war crimes which are taking place today. Collective punishment, and we can talk later about the results of that. Ethnic cleansing, which is, in my opinion, the Israeli real plan, which is to try to ethnically cleanse all of Gaza into Egypt. And finally, an act of genocide, which has taken already, in addition to the 1,400 Israelis killed in Hamas strike, we have now 7,000 Palestinians killed, including no less than 2,900 children. Every five minutes, a Palestinian is killed. Every 10 to 15 minutes, another Palestinian child dies. This is the situation we are in. And the West Bank also witnesses a lot of troubles. So far, Israelis have killed the Israeli army and settlers have killed 104 Palestinians in the West Bank during the last 20 days. Thank you. Um, 
thank you for that. You hinted at Palestinian Palestinian authority not being one party that didn't allow uh, elections uh, as well. As a Palestinian reflecting back, uh, you know how we got here. I get the point on U.S. failures, uh, not uh, resuming the peace negotiations. What are major Palestinian failures from your vantage point that uh, got us here? The first failure is that we did not have elections since 2006. And that is the biggest failure. Uh, the second biggest failure is that uh, the Palestinian Authority obstructed any real efforts towards unification of Palestinians and to having unity. Uh, and uh, the third failure is what we see today, this passiveness of the Palestinian Authority, as if, not, as if they are sort of uh, not part of what's going on. I mean, I mean that, this is very dangerous, and it, it aggravates people, and it makes them very angry. Uh, but of course, uh, of course uh, one of the greatest failures here is that even when Palestinians tend to nonviolence, as I did, and uh, you know I led many, many nonviolent actions, we were always encountered with severe violence from the Israeli side. Even the peace marches in Gaza, uh, you remember what happened. So uh, th there is a big, big, big blame here on the Israeli side, which consistently and continuously encountered Palestinians only with violence and with the continuation of occupation. What strikes me so much is the act of witch hunting that is happening now against Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, only because he dared, after condemning the attack on Israelis, he dared to remind everybody with the fact that this did not come from a vacuum and that we have an occupation that is 56 years old and an ethnic cleansing that is 75 years old and uh, that there is a context of what's happening. And uh, what, what shocked me more is the statement of the foreign minister of Israel, Mr. Cohen, who said in the United Nations openly and clearly that from now on there is no place for balanced positions. Either you are with us or you are our enemy. That is very strange. As strange as it is, and by the way, I have to mention that, uh, was the map that Mr. Netanyahu carried in the United Nations in front of everybody a few weeks ago, which showed the map of Israel, including annexing the West Bank and annexing Gaza, in addition to the Golan Heights. The only government that criticized that act was the German government at the time. And that passed. But that makes it clear to people now here that the real, the, real, the real goal of Mr. Netanyahu is really to ethnically cleanse Gaza. And I can talk later about that in details and annex it to Israel. Thank you. I think you're referencing the during the General Assembly meetings, the map that uh, Netanyahu uh, showed of the what he called the new Middle East. Um, uh, Dr. Moashir, um, I want to ask you, we're at a different regional moment. The Middle East is boiling. Uh, Jordan has been seeing almost daily protests in solidarity with the uh, Palestinians. We've mentioned the border clashes uh, with Lebanon. Uh, Egypt is extremely worried. Where do you see this, this uh, regional upheaval? Are you, how worried are you uh, of this escalating to a regional uh, war in a way we haven't seen since uh, 1973. I want to refer to Jordan and Egypt. Maybe Amr will also address the Egyptian issue. Real worry. First of all, you know, what uh, Dr. Mustafa alluded to is the crux of the problem. We have an occupation. And there have been many attempts in the past to ignore the occupation and to try to come up with ad hoc solutions here and there. It is very clear from what has been going on that this is not going to work, that the cycle of violence between the two sides is going to remain until we, you know, we meaning the international community, understands that we have to address the occupation issue. And any political process that might come out of this, and I'm still skeptical uh, in the short term of any political process that might come out, but any political process that attempts once again 
to address ad hoc issues, to uh, look at small problems here and there, and ease the situation in a very limited way is not going to succeed. Unless we address the issue of the occupation seriously and, you know, towards ending that occupation, I'm afraid that the cycle of violence is going to go on. Jordan today is very worried. I'll, I'll let uh, Amr speak about Egypt. I think he has a similar view. It's very worried that if the current Israeli coalition does not want to end the occupation and does not want uh, to establish a Palestinian state, and they clearly don't because they have said that many times. And if on top of that, the Israelis don't want a Palestinian majority in areas under Israel's control, and today the Palestinians constitute a majority, 7.4 million to 7.2 million, then the only alternative Israel has is to affect a mass transfer from Gaza to Egypt, and if the situation extends to the West Bank, and it is already extending to the West Bank, as uh, Dr. Mustafa have, has alluded, from the West Bank to Jordan. We used to think that this is a thing of the past. But frankly, after Ukraine and after Syria, you know, mass transfer of people is not something imaginary. It has happened. It has happened more than once. And... Uh, 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 the logical conclusion that countries like Jordan and Egypt have is that if Israel does not want the first two options, uh, then the only third option is to try to get rid of as many Palestinians as possible. That is the real concern. Uh, you know, the, the Israeli argument, and I'd like you to, to weigh in on that, is, look, we've left Gaza in 2005. We're not an occupying power on the ground uh, in, in Gaza. We've left South Lebanon in 2000, and we still see uh, instability. Uh, I'm sure you know the situation in Gaza. So how do you, how would you respond? Israel, Israel has never left Gaza. Israel has locked up Gaza in a big prison since they left in 2005. Israel has not allowed the Palestinians from Gaza to have their own seaport, to have their own airport to have their own economy. That's not leaving Gaza. That's locking up Gaza in a big prison. Uh, not just that, but without also giving a political horizon to end the occupation, the last peace process, the last negotiations that took place between Palestinians and Israelis were in 2014, nine years ago. So you keep people locked up in a big prison for 18 years without a political horizon for nine years, I don't think we should have been surprised by what has happened. Mm. Uh, Celine, I want to uh, go to you uh, and ask you, you've been monitoring the situation in Gaza for the last 12 years. Were you surprised by the October uh, 7 events? Um, I think that there was always an assumption that um, Hamas very much wanted, it was seeking ways to capture soldiers and civilians. It was always a working assumption um, that they were doing everything possible to achieve that objective. Um, in that sense, I would say it's not a surprise. Uh, it is a surprise because there was kind of a working assumption that you can uh, domesticate Hamas uh, and that it could kind of work in a transactional way with, you know, receiving cut-off funds and, and so bringing back a, a reducing tension in Gaza as a result, and that there could kind of be a, a, um, a, this kind of a, a quid pro quo with the organization. And in that sense, I think that the surprise uh, comes from those that uh, dismiss the fundamental ideology of the organization um, that could not, did not want to, um, uh, only to secure uh, their control over Gaza, but uh, primarily to um, achieve um, an ideologic um, um, uh, objective, even at the risk of, uh, uh, of compromising 
the possibility of the organization to maintain control uh, over Gaza. Um, and that was, I think, a profound mistake in the assessment that were made by the uh, intelligence um, uh, and the political echelon in Israel. I tend to kind of avoid putting the blame uh, um, on uh, Israeli intelligence because I think that it kind of clean our political leadership from the responsibility uh, of the failed policy that it has um, advanced when it comes to uh, to Gaza, but also to the West Bank. Um, thank you. And uh, I know you're in Tel Aviv right now. How is the situation on the ground? Uh, the rocket barrages have not stopped despite, uh, you know, heavy airstrikes inside Gaza. How is, if you can give us a sense of how it's over there? Uh, so first I'm in Tel Aviv, so I certainly do not want to compare uh, what I'm suffering uh, with uh, what is the communities, uh, the Israeli communities living uh, at the border of Gaza have been enduring. Uh, it is uh, uh, impossible to compare. Uh, but um, I mean, we there is sirens all the time uh, in a regular basis. Uh, uh, people don't go to work, children don't go to school. Um, and again, I don't want to go into a comparison with, between, you know, uh, what the civilian population in Gaza is enduring. Um, I don't think that uh, we should kind of um, uh, uh, co compete one another with the level of suffering. Uh, I, I regret any civilian suffering in, in the tragedy that, that is taking place here. But uh, I think that there is a, a um, serious trauma in Israel uh, when we, uh, a very deep one, uh, when we saw the picture of uh, um, Hamas um, uh, militants uh, entering uh, door to door in, um, in these Israeli communities, uh, 15 communities surrounding Gaza and, and uh, brutally murdering um, um, uh, people living there without discrimination. Uh, so I, I, I think there is a collective uh, trauma here, but uh, I feel privileged uh, to, to, to live in a place where I don't directly and personally uh, uh, suffer from this. Uh, not at least as a, to the same scope, I would say. Thank you. Uh, Amr, I want to turn uh, to you. Egypt, is at the center uh, of this, whether uh, through uh, control of the Rafah uh, crossing, the only passage out of Gaza at the moment, whether in mediating uh, the uh, release of uh, 200 hostages that are still uh, with Hamas and uh, the fears of uh, you know, displacement and transfer that uh, Marwan uh, spoke about. Uh, how do you see this? How alarming is this to, to Cairo? Uh, this is also coming on the heels of a December uh, election. So uh, if you can give us the assessment uh, where you see Egypt in, in all of this. Sure. Thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, it's definitely an alarming situation that has been unfolding in the last three weeks almost in Gaza uh, at, at uh, different levels which I would like to outline very briefly. The first level is the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Gaza for uh, almost two and a half million uh, citizens of Gaza which have been facing the Israeli collective punishment, a war crime uh, that Israel has started to commit right after the attacks of October 7, which I personally condemned um, uh, in many different ways but also Arab governments did condemn, and I believe most Arab civil society organizations have condemned as well. We're clearly, we have a, a, a clear public opinion in the region condemning the killing of civilians. But the two and a half million Palestinians living in Gaza have been facing uh, Israeli collective punishment starting October 8th. It has led to a humanitarian crisis in response to it. Egypt government and civil society have been trying to act to ease the humanitarian crisis. 
So there's a great deal of misinformation happening here in the U.S., in Europe to an extent about the Rafah crossing, which has not been closed by the Egyptian side, has actually been bombed several times by the Israeli side and closed several times by the Israeli side as well. There are convoys of humanitarian aid waiting at the Rafah crossing to cross over to Gaza. And we've been seeing images and hearing interviews from civil society activists uh, from Egypt and elsewhere in the Arab world and the world waiting at the Rafah crossing to pass. And this is not an Egyptian blockade. It's from the other side, one. The second level, which is interesting to look at, is a governance crisis that Egypt is afraid of and that is emerging in Gaza because you, 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 you cannot only look at what's happening right now in terms of the tragedy unfolding and the huge number of casualties among civilians and the massive destruction happening, but we are um, witnessing the specter of a ground operation that might happen soon. We still have uh, we still have hostages in uh, in Gaza. We still have, and um, uh, besides the two and a half million Palestinians, dual national strap. There are different governance issues emerging, and Egypt is foremost, just like Jordan, and it's more relevant in the case of Egypt as of now, is, of course, very worried about any scenario of displacement. And the position here has been uh, quite clear at, at um, uh, in many different ways. One, that we are against displacement, and this is not a government position. I would like everyone who is with us on the call to be aware of the fact that this is not an Egyptian government position. This is an Egyptian popular position. The government position is fully backed by the popular sentiment. We will not let our national sovereignty or the borders be be uh, abused to solve an Israeli problem of not accepting a two-state solution, of not accepting an end to the occupation and get, getting rid of the Palestinian issue. The second level is to organize uh, Arab a clear Arab position. And here, bilateral coordination with Jordan has been key. Uh, today, in fact, before coming to, the U to you, there is a press statement which came out from nine Arab countries, uh, Egypt and Jordan, with most Gulf countries as well as Morocco, condemning not only the atrocities happening in Gaza, but also any talk about displacement and any talk about denying Palestinians their legitimate rights. The third level has been domestically in Egypt to allow for an interplay, a positive interplay between government and civil society, which we have been seeing in many different ways. Last point I would like to, to make on, 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 on the Egyptian side, the, the concern is, and here we can really evoke several moments in the Arab past. We can go back to 1970 in Jordan. We can go back to 1982 in Lebanon. We can go back to 1991 post-liberation uh, of Kuwait war and the Madrid conference. There are concerns cross-regionally about regional security arrangements following what's happening in Gaza. It is clear that Gaza would not be contained to Gaza. There are huge risks about displacement, of um, uh, evacuation, of, um, as Mustafa and Marwan mentioned, that the, the mass transfer, which is being discussed, and there is some language emerging in the Biden administration documents, the request which was put forward to the House of Representatives on October 20, uh, very alarming, uh, assigning three and a half billion US dollars to um, Gazans and Palestinians uh, evacuated to neighboring countries. These are very challenging issues that warrants attention. They are getting attention from policymakers in Egypt, and they are trying to coordinate regionally and with Europe and the US as well. Um, I see what you're saying, but then what do you tell with a ground invasion looming, as you mentioned, what do you tell 2.3 million trapped in Gaza? Where, where, should, I, where should they go? What, what, what happens? I mean, isn't this also a human uh, responsibility to allow some sort of safe zone, some sort of passage for these people to get out? I, I mean, to be to be very honest and blunt, uh, Joyce, and I do understand the human suffering happening and the specter of the ground operation uh, that will um, definitely result in greater human suffering. This is a manipulation of the debate. Israel as an occupying force, and as Marwan mentioned, Israel actually has never left Gaza. The siege on Gaza almost for two decades has been imposed by Israel. Israel has never left the West Bank. We have an occupation force, and it is mandated by international law to be responsible responsible for occupied territories. Israel's withdrawal from Gaza was a one-sided step, which did not lead to a Palestinian state. We have a real governance issue here, a, a vacuum, which Hamas, in fact, stepped into filling starting 2007. And as Mustafa was mentioning, ob obstructing all domestic 
steps on the Palestinian side to get new elections, to get uh, past the one-party rule in the West Bank as well as in Gaza, PA on the one hand and Hamas on the other hand, all of these steps happened with Israeli blessing, if not due to Israeli policy. So Israel is an occupying force. Israel faces the responsibility of accounting for its responsibilities according to international law. Um, and this cannot be pushed on the Jordanian side or on the Egyptian side. What Egypt can do is to keep working on the humanitarian aid, keep working on delaying the ground operation regionally uh, to avert uh, the specter of the ground operation, to work on the release of hostages, protecting humanitarian uh, and civilian population from a humanitarian perspective, and mostly being very attentive to its national sovereignty concerns, its national security concerns, that our territory will not be abused to solve a problem which the occupying force created. Um. I mean, no easy answers, obviously. I want to go to Dr. Barghouti and ask again about the, the situation in the West Bank. We've seen um, at least 100 people have been, have been killed since this started. We've already have been seeing tension for over the last year in, in the West Bank. If a ground invasion uh, happens, uh, how do you see this evolving in Ramallah, in, in the West Bank more generally? There are two reasons why Hamas attacked. Uh, first one is uh, what was happening to the people in the West Bank. Uh, during the first eight months before the 7th of October, the Israeli army and Israeli settlers, I remind you, uh, killed no less than 248 Palestinians, including 50 children. Uh, one of them was two and a half years old. The Israeli settlers conducted terror attacks on many communities. You remember the case of Hawara, you remember the case of Tormus Aya, where American Palestinians were attacked and their houses burned, etc. During the same period, there was consistent attacks on the Aqsa Mosque and trying to change its nature. There were attacks on Christian holy places as well, with extremists spitting on uh, clerks and on people who were praying there. And uh, most important, Netanyahu was advocating that the Palestinian cause will be finished through the normalization of Saudi Arabia, which would close the whole cycle of normalization with Arab countries. These were important factors that, uh, in my opinion, uh, moved Hamas. Hamas is not a government of Gaza. Hamas is a movement of uh, all Palestinians. I mean, and uh, for them, the issue of Jerusalem is even more important than the issue of any part of Gaza. So to expect that they will just accept to be enclaved in Gaza and do nothing about what, what was happening uh, everywhere was a huge mistake, of course. Uh, but, but the West Bank today is facing something horrible. We don't have Hamas government here. But uh, what we see now is fragmentation of the West Bank in, in no less than 224 small uh, ghettos separated from each other by 650 military checkpoints. Many of the military checkpoints are shut off completely. There is a great amount of settler terror going on everywhere. Already we have 20 communities in the West Bank that have been ethnically cleansed by Israeli settler terror. And uh, the reality is that Israel is already conducting an act of ethnic cleansing in Area C, which is no less than 60% of the West Bank. That is the reality of what's going on. And uh, even medical services now are prohibited from reaching many communities in Area C. It's a total amount of humanitarian suffering now, also in the West Bank. <clears throat> and uh, they cannot blame Hamas for that. Uh, this, is, this is the doing of the Israeli occupation. Uh, now, the question of ground invasion and uh, well, Sisi said something very interesting. He said, if Israel cares about the people of Gaza while it wants to bombard it completely, why don't they let them into Israel? Uh, anyhow, 70% of these people came from uh, the areas in, in what is now called Israel. They were ethnically cleansed from there. But they don't care about their safety. They don't care about the lives of people. 
The reality here that should not be ignored is that there is a plan of ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strip, and if that works, there will be a plan of ethnic cleansing of West Bank. That's what Egypt and Jordan are so, are so worried about. I'm not bringing in something that is not known. Netanyahu said in the very first beginning of this operation that all Palestinians in Gaza must leave their homes. Where to? Either to the sea or to Egypt. And then his spokesperson, Richard Richt, said something that became the title of the newspaper of Idiot Aranot, where he said that all Palestinians in Gaza must leave their homes and go to Egypt. And when Egypt said no, Mr. Cohen, the foreign minister of Israel, said, brought about a plan B, where he said we will shrink the size of Gaza, which means in case they cannot open the borders and force people out of Gaza, they will bring force them out of well, north and center of Gaza, including Gaza City to the south, practically clustering 2.4 million people or 2.3 million people in less than 80 square miles, and then taking over the north and the center and will never allow any Palestinian to come back there, and they will say this is security zone. The, 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 the plan is very clear. And uh, if anybody has doubts, I mean, you could just uh, refer to what uh, Israeli officials are saying. So we are witnessing here, I mean, okay, you are academics and, 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 and politicians and people who, who know the history. Let me remind you that uh, 40 years ago and 35 years ago, there was no Hamas. Hamas did not exist. But the Palestinian cause existed. What created Fatah? in the first place, Fatah, which used to be considered terrorist movement before Hamas became the terrorist movement. Fatah was created because of the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from Palestine through the erasing of 520 Palestinian communities. They became 7 million refugees today. This is the reason. And, and, and then now they talk about another ethnic cleansing as a solution. What, even if they eliminate Hamas, which they cannot do, because Hamas is not only in Gaza, and Hamas is an idea before it is an organization, uh, that doesn't mean I agree with what they did, but I say that this is the, the root problem, the cause problem is what Marwan described very well, which is the issue of occupation and depriving Palestinians from their basic right of self-determination. So this cycle will continue. And let me remind you, it's not just Hamas that is considered now a terrorist organization. According to American laws in the Congress, the PLO is still a terrorist organization. Uh, so, I mean, where is where can we find justice? Finally, I tell you, I was so alerted and so worried when something happened recently, which is the fact that the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, the Armenians, were practically ethnically cleansed. And the fact that the world just watched that and did nothing uh, gives a very serious... I, I'm sure Netanyahu got the message that maybe you can do it too. Uh, and that's what worries me now. The alternative to this is very simple. Immediate ceasefire. And that will lead to immediate release of the 50 civilians and Israelis with dual nationality for no, in exchange for nothing. And then we can have exchange of prisoners. And then maybe we can have the world paying attention to a new real process that would lead to ending this conflict rather than protracting it. This is one alternative. The other alternative, ethnic cleansing of Gaza, another ground invasion. Who, what do you think this will lead to in the region? I am sure this will be a regional war, and this will create instability everywhere in the region. Is that what Mr. Biden wants, by just following what Netanyahu tells him? Uh, thank you. A lot of points uh, there. I don't know if you, if it's fair to conclude that the Hamas attack on October 7 played right into the Israeli government hands. If what you're talking about ethnic transfers or other or broader uh, takeover in in Gaza, do, do you think that October 7 was was a mistake on on part of Hamas? 
Uh, I think uh, I think uh, what happened should not have happened, and uh, definitely attacking civilians should not have happened in any way. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see what they will say themselves about what was done. But uh, the, the reality here is that uh, one of the reasons why maybe this has happened is that there is the absolute closure of any perspective of any change of the situation with one gloomy picture of the only process that was happening in the Middle East regarding Palestinians since Trump came to power and Biden continued the same policy of Trump, which is liquidating the Palestinian cause. Mm. And, and, and that was a, definitely is a motivating factor for anybody. Uh, Marwan, I want to come back to you on some points that Dr. Barghouti mentioned. Um, Hamas took over Gaza by force in, in 2007. The goal of the so-called goal, initial goal of the Israeli uh, incursion would be to destroy, to eliminate uh, Hamas. Is that realistic in in your opinion and what what are your realistic options are out there for uh for the israelis we remember joyce that israel tried to eliminate hezbollah in lebanon in 2006 and it was a pro, pro, you know a long war that did not succeed in eliminating uh hamas first israel is not good at a guerrilla war and, uh, you know, going in uh, Gaza is going to be far more difficult than going in South Lebanon, where Gaza has a, where Hamas has a, a network of underground tunnels, where the area is extremely crowded, where there is no way but to inflict very heavy civilian casualties in any operation. Hamas has become an ideology, not just a movement. Uh, and 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 if Hamas military machine is destroyed, you know, I'm afraid that many other Hamases will spring up. Uh, remember again, Hezbollah's military machine was largely destroyed in 2006. Today, Hezbollah has a far more uh, military uh, strength than it did in 2006. So that is not going to solve the issue. Military solutions of this kind cannot solve the issue. Only a political process can. The problem with a political process, Joyce, that I see is that I just don't see who's going to lead one. Uh, after all this is done, you know, are the Americans going to lead a political process when they, one, have not done that for the last nine years, Two, when they have a presidential election where Mr. Biden does not want any daylight between his position and that of the Republicans on the peace process. The Israeli government is finished. It's gone. Uh, but it is, does not mean that any successor to Netanyahu is going to be softer on the peace process than uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu. Today, the divide in Israel is not between the pro peace and the anti-peace movement. It is between the pro-Netanyahu and anti-Netanyahu forces. So it is not clear that any successor Israeli government is going to uh, uh, be, be more forthcoming when it comes to peace. And on the Palestinian front, I totally agree with, with Mustafa. You need elections. You know, the, the, the Palestinian authority has lost all credibility and legitimacy in, in the eyes of the Palestinian people, even before October 7. With October 7, I doubt that they have any uh, sort of approval among the Palestinian public. If we are to engage in a political process, you need a new Palestinian leadership, wherever it comes from, that is more reflective of the views of the Palestinian public. Now, all of these are difficult, uh, difficult, if not impossible, assumptions uh, to meet in the short term. So my fear is that a lot of people are going to lose their lives with no political end in sight. Not until at least after the U.S. elections can we even hope for a political process. And if a political process you know, does happen after the 
2024 elections. It cannot be a repeat of the past. It cannot be a political process that once again engages in never-ending negotiations that never get you anywhere. If there is no political process that bluntly ends the occupation, it's not going to succeed. So in the short term, I'm afraid that the, the outlook is rather uh, gloomy. Thank you. Uh, Celine, uh, very good points by both Marwan and uh, Mustafa. How, how determined is Israel or how bent is the Netanyahu government on launching a ground invasion? One, and then I'm going to bring in a question from, from the audience. Who would be at the negotiating table if this goes through and let's say they overthrow Hamas in Gaza? What would that even look like? What does a post Hamas Gaza uh, look like? Okay. Um, first, um, please allow me to react a little bit to uh, some of the comments that were made by Dr. Baguti that made me. Uh, a little bit uncomfortable to see. Um, and I, I just want to, um, sure. and, and I'm not a politician and a boy generally, uh, um, to, to kind of um, enter into this kind of argument. Uh, but I, I, I find the, the attempt to link between uh, Hamas' decision um, to perpetuate um, this barbaric attack between uh, the killing uh, in the West Bank a little bit problematic um, in the sense that I genuinely think that Hamas not only does not care about uh, Israeli um, fate, but also about the fate of the Palestinian uh, people in Gaza and the West Bank as well. And um, I, I don't think that we can bring any rational thinking in, into the kind of decision that uh, they have made uh, on September, October, beyond the fact that they are uh, struggling for the Palestinian um, leadership and are uh, also very much interested in bringing uh, the PA down. So I don't think that they care that much about uh, Palestinian interest uh, at the civilian level uh, in that context. But uh, putting that comment aside um, and thinking of uh, your question about uh, Netanyahu's, uh, where he's looking at, I, Netanyahu in general is averse to big decisions, whether it is peace or war. Uh, this is something that very much characterizes his thinking is uh, is a true believer uh, in uh, the status quo, uh, something that we all know is a, um, is an illusion and uh, that has led us to the kind of situation and deadlock that we have been seeing in the Israeli-Palestinian um, uh, conflict for so many years. Um, what what mattered to me here is. Uh, uh, to reflect on some of the point, uh, very good point that Amir did uh, made, is when we look at what next, uh, what should be the objective here? And um, I think that the objective should be to lay the foundation for a different reality, one that will prevent such a tragedy from happening again. And this requires to prevent a return to status quo ante. And in that sense, it requires indeed to um, um, to counter uh, uh, Netanyahu's uh, attempt to bring us back to the exact same reality that we um, have known for the last uh, uh, 12 years in, uh, in Gaza. And that requires a profound shift of paradigm so that the pattern of violence that has led time and again to the exact same deadlock between Israel and Gaza will end. I think we need to keep that objective in mind uh, when defining the policy that will address the immediate challenge that we are likely to face after the war. Uh, one of these challenges, uh, which um, Amir uh, outlined, is uh, that we will uh, see a post-war governmental vacuum in both civil and security matters. 
And when trying to identify who should be uh, uh, the administration that would run Gaza affairs. I you mean avoid inside Gaza? So you're saying a war, a ground invasion would overthrow Gaza from, uh, sorry, overthrow Hamas from power. I Just think that when we see how Israel has defined the objective of this war as dismantling Hamas military and governing capacity, there is indeed a risk that we will be facing such a post-war vacuum and that we will see what we have qualified as a Somalia-like kind of a reality. This is not something that uh, would sell neither Israeli security interests nor the need for the Palestinian civilian population in Gaza to rebuild and to live in, in a sense of uh, security. Now, I think that the challenge here is when we try to identify uh, who should be the administration that would run Gaza affair, that uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, remains a preferred long-term governing alternative. But we do recognize when, when, when we uh, outline that, that there is a very difficult challenge that will need to be addressed. Uh, there is a lack of capacity to control and manage the, the gas strip. We see that the PA also struggle to uh, control part of the West Bank. Uh, so it's, a, it's an important question mark. Uh, and there is a lack of political legitimacy uh, uh, that the PA is struggling with. And to be perceived to exploit an Israeli operation to regain, to regain control of the strip uh, will be highly problematic and uh, we contribute uh, for the PA to lose residual uh, legitimacy. So the question is how you pave the way for the PA to return under these kind of circumstances. So we need to think of, you know, interim measures. But when we outline these measures, I think it's very important to relate to the long-term objective that we have. This interim measure needs to be connected to the ultimate objective that the PA will be in charge of both the West Bank and Gaza, and that we will end the Palestinian uh, division. It's also an interest, I think, for um, Israel's security, because this, div this division, I think, in my view, has been the primarily motivation of these wars. Uh, not only the aspiration to end the occupation, I do not uh, uh, dismiss that this is one of the motivations, but this is not the only motivation. Now, one, one more point that is very important in my view is that when we try to outline what is required for the PA to be relevant in Gaza, we need to recognize that this is not a Gaza only problem and that the PA will reject. Uh, the possibility to play a role in Gaza when the situation in the West Bank remains as it is. Uh, it will not be able to, to be a legitimate player if we continue with the same kind of policy um, inside the West Bank in parallel. And the same will apply regarding the aspiration to see Egypt and other regional players to play a role in Gaza. I don't see them to be capable to play a strong role if in parallel in the West Bank and in Jerusalem, we see the kind of same provocation uh, by the Israeli government. And therefore, when we think about Gaza and uh, a strategy to shift paradigm regarding to Gaza, it has to be holistic and it has to refer to the West Bank as well. Thank yeah. you. Joyce, yeah. can I say something, please? Very quickly, because I want to go to Hammer on an important question. Go ahead. It is a grave mistake to deal with the matter as if it's a Gaza problem only. And uh, why would we as Palestinians accept any kind of foreign control of Gaza or UN control of Gaza? Gaza is supposed to be part of the Palestinian state. And we are talking, if, we, if, if everybody continues to speak about two-state solution, I don't know why Gaza should be different from the West Bank. But you cannot have two-state solution without ending occupation of both West Bank and Gaza. Reoccupying Gaza will not solve any problem. And the Israeli, the Israeli establishment cannot control Gaza if, if it reoccupies it again. So I think the problem here is very linked. And it would be a grave mistake politically and from human perspective to start to treat Gaza and separation from the West Bank. That would be a very, very wrong mistake. On the other hand, 
bringing in the PA or any any kind of puppet group to control Gaza will not also solve the problem. If you want to negotiate with Palestinians, you need a democratically elected body that that is accepted by the Palestinian people and that is capable of reflecting and presenting the aspiration of Palestinians. To enforce on Palestinians a leadership that would compromise their, their, their ultimate goal of becoming free and independent will also not solve the problem. Thank you. Uh, Amr, I want to go to you. We have just in very short time, we have a good question from the audience too. What, what's the role of uh, public protests we're seeing uh, in solidarity with the Palestinians? They're London, Chicago, Brooklyn. Uh, do you have a measurable impact on uh, how this would impact US or Egypt or Jordan's uh, policies? And very briefly, what what is an outcome that would be acceptable uh, to Egypt uh, from this? Thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, let me let me start with a second question, and I I believe it's too early to speak about outcomes. Uh, we are in the middle of a war. We are in the middle of a humanitarian and governance crisis, a humanitarian crisis that has already been unfolding, a governance crisis that is emerging, and it's definitely a crisis which is not restricted to Palestine and Israel, a crisis which has huge regional and international ramifications. So it's very difficult to speak about uh, what would be acceptable outcomes. Let me, however, outline the policy principles uh, which are uh, pushed forward by the Egyptian government and are supported by the popular sentiment. And I believe they are supported by the popular sentiment across the Arab world, not only in Egypt or in Jordan as a neighboring country to Palestine and Israel as well. The first principle is, that, and, and it's a combined principle of rejecting violations uh, of the national sovereignty of neighboring countries of Israel and Palestine and rejecting the dissolution, the total dissolution of the Palestinian cause via uh, an ethnic cleansing or a mass transfer. What is here at stake is to avoid a new Nakba. And I feel that the reference should be used more and more and that in international media and international uh, press coverage, we really need to refer to the danger of a new Nakba for the Palestinians. And Mustafa's point is, why are you deciding for Palestinians saying that they would like or uh, would want to accept an international or an Arab uh, rule of any sorts? What is here at stake is avoiding a Nakba via obstructing and stopping plans for ethnic cleansing and mass transfer and allowing Palestinians in a gradual fashion, of course, with a clear timeline. And I, I'm in favor of what Celine said. I mean, there are immediate policy measures which need to be taken and pushed forward, and there are medium-term and long-term policy measures. But the first principle for Egypt is to avoid ethnic cleansing, mass transfer, and avoid, by means of avoiding that, any transgressions, any violations of our national sovereignty. Second point is, and here is a question about the Egyptian national fabric. I mean, I, I feel sometimes that they are um, in the West, uh, policies as well as media are speaking about Egypt very similar to the way they are speaking about Jordan and Palestine without factoring in popular will. I mean, who told you, I mean, as Mustafa said, who told you that Palestinians would like to be ruled by Arab or international uh, uh, governments? Who told you that Egyptians would accept the resettlement of two and a half million on our territory or that Jordanians are willing to see the nature of the social fabric uh, change drastically? There are existential fears which the government are pushing forward and they reflect popular fears in Egypt that we are against any violation of what our national fabric stands for. We are, an, uh, we are Egypt, uh, first and foremost. We are an Arab country in solidarity with Palestine, but not at our expense. Third principle is coordination and negotiation. And here I see a great possibility for a future and a forward-looking policy prescription. Egypt is coordinating regionally. Egypt is working with the Europeans. And with the U.S., and I realize how 
how not paralyzed, but how different U.S. interests or different groups within the administration and on Capitol Hill are when it comes to this question of Palestine. But what Egypt can do is to push forward a regional international policy prescription for the next day. What will happen after the war? Of course, it's important to stop the humanitarian crisis, to avert maybe the ground operation if possible, to release hostages, to ease suffering of civilians. But if it does not happen and we come to the ground operation, what will happen next is of grave significance, not only for Palestine, Israel, but for the region as well. So the effort diplomatically to push forward a revival of the two-state solution, a revival of Palestinian self-determination. I feel, Joyce, that the language sometimes is not even used. I mean, what is here at stake is Palestinian self-determination, not ethnic cleansing, not mass transfer. This needs to be stopped. For, for the protests worldwide, they are important. They make policymakers attentive. Um, Arab governments find themselves in an uh, opportune moment in which both government policies and popular sentiments are in sync. So um, I, 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 I believe that they are backing, they have a backing nature of what governments, especially in Egypt and Jordan, are, are doing. And they maybe put some pressure on international policymakers to stop their double standards and the treatment which we've been seeing in the last three weeks. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Dr. Moashir, I want to end uh, with you. We're, we're already uh, out of time. Uh, on the regional question, uh, this started at this in the same week where um, you know Washington was being hopeful about a Saudi uh, Israeli uh, normalization. Where does this, all of this, the, the death toll, the carnage, where does this leave um, Arab-Israeli uh, normalization? And, you know, the, the title uh, of this, this panel is What Comes Next? So what do you see on, on the day after? Washington has reduced peacemaking in the region in the last few years to normalization agreements with the Arab world that sort of park the Palestinian question aside. Their thinking was that maybe normalization agreements would create a new environment in the region that makes peace more conducive. Israel, of course, has used this uh, to give themselves the false impression that they can have peace in the region without needing to come to terms with the Palestinians. What October 7 has done is that it has shattered this theory that peace is possible in the region without coming to terms with the Palestinians. In the end, it is the Palestinians that are living next to the Israelis. It's not the Saudis, it's not the Bahrainis, it's not the Emiratis. And I think and hope that this, once and for all, brings home the, the you know, realization that without peace with the Palestinians, peace is not going to come to the Middle East. That is, does not necessarily mean that normalization agreements will stop. I, 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 I think that they will resume, frankly, after a hiatus uh, 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 of what will happen uh, uh, you know, in the next few months. But regardless, whether they resume or not, because of purely bilateral reasons and not because of the peace process, that is not a substitute to coming to terms with the Palestinians. Thank you all so much, uh, Dr. Barghouti, Amr, Selin, uh, Marwan. It was, it was an honor sharing uh, the stage with you. Thanks to Carnegie and our audience for tuning in today. Hope next time uh, we follow up on this, we would have slightly better times in, uh, in the region. Um, much appreciated and uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you.